Let's look into confidence intervals for the ratio of population variances. So we're going to come up with a method of constructing confidence intervals for sigma 1 squared over sigma 2 squared. And for this method, we are going to be assuming that we are sampling from normally distributed populations. So we're going to let S1 squared be the sample variance of N1 independent observations from a normally distributed population with variance sigma 1 squared. Similarly, S2 squared is a sample variance of N2 independent observations from a normally distributed population with variance sigma 2 squared. And we're going to assume that the samples are independent. We're going to need that for this method to be reasonable. If the samples are indeed independent, then this statistic here has an F distribution with n1 minus 1 degrees of freedom in the numerator and n2 minus 1 degrees of freedom in the denominator. And we're going to use that idea to come up with the confidence interval for that ratio of population variances. Now when we're about to draw our samples, this s1 squared and this s2 squared are random variables, and thus this entire quantity here is a random variable with an f distribution. And the probability it lies between these two values is 1 minus alpha. Now visually, that's going to look something like this. If we draw out an f distribution here with the appropriate degrees of freedom, then what we're saying is there is some f value over here that has an area to the right of alpha over 2. And we call that f value f sub alpha over 2. And there's some f value over here that yields an area to the left of alpha over 2. And we call that value f sub 1 minus alpha over 2 because this f value has an area of 1 minus alpha over 2 to the right. So this middle area here is 1 minus alpha. And the probability that this random variable takes on a value between these two values is 1 minus alpha. Now we're simply going to rework this equation to get sigma 1 squared over sigma 2 squared on its own. And if we do that, this is what we end up with. And you can work through the algebra yourself, but this is going to end up being the lower bound of our confidence interval. And this is going to end up being the upper bound of our confidence interval. And bringing all that together, we have our final formula here. A 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence interval for the ratio of population variances is given by these two quantities that we derived above. Now let's work through an example. Is there a difference in the variability of the amount of fill in 475 gram and 850 gram cereal boxes? 475 gram and 850 gram is what's listed on the boxes, but there is some variability in the actual amount of cereal that is in these boxes. And I investigated this on these two sizes of my favorite breakfast cereal. So this is real data here. I got samples of these two types of boxes. I got four of the 850 gram boxes and 15 of the 475. Took away the box, took away the bag, measured the amount of cereal in there by weight, and then calculated the sample variance. And if we went through and just took the ratio of sample variances, if I just took S1 squared over S2 squared, this would be our 40.917 over 16.714. And this works out to 2.448, two three decimal places. Now this is our point estimate of the quantity sigma 1 squared over sigma 2 squared, the ratio of the population variances. Now based on this, it might seem that the 850 gram boxes do have a little bit greater variability. But this point estimate only tells us so much, and we would like to investigate this further, perhaps with a confidence interval. Let's say we want to construct a 95% confidence interval for the ratio of population variances. And here's our information from the last page. And here is our formula for our confidence interval. Now a 95% confidence interval means alpha is 0 
And our degrees of freedom in the numerator, remember, are simply n1 minus 1. So this is going to be 4 minus 1, or 3 degrees of freedom in the numerator, and 15 minus 1, or 14 degrees of freedom in the denominator. Now we're going to draw out an f curve here, and this is an f distribution with these degrees of freedom. And I'm going to have over here somewhere a value of f that yields an area to the right of alpha over 2, which is going to be 0 0.025, simply 0 0.05 over 2. Over here somewhere is another value of f that yields an area to the left of 0 0.025. And we're going to call this value of f, f.025, the f value with 0.025 to the right. And we're going to call this value of f, f.975, the f value with 0.975 to the right. Now we can get these values from a computer or a table. And I'm just going to tell you what they are here. This is 4.2417. And this one is 0 0.0700 to four decimal places. And I have separate videos for how to find those values in a table or using the computer package R. Now we've got all the information that we need to construct our interval. So this value here is simply going to be 40.917 over 16.714, the ratio of the sample variances, over my f.025. Four. 0.2417. And the upper bound of the interval is going to be the same numerator, 40.917 over 16.714, the ratio of the sample variances, over 0 0.0700. And what we end up with, if we don't use any round off error and we take that all the way, what we end up with is 0 0.577 and 34. 0.951 to three decimal places. You might get slightly different values depending on how much round off error there is in your calculations. But this is a 95% confidence interval for the ratio sigma 1 squared over sigma 2 squared. Or in other words, we can be 95% confident that the ratio of population variances lies between the two values that we just calculated. Now one thing we might note is that the value 1 is contained in our confidence interval. Why is that meaningful? Well, this is a confidence interval for sigma 1 squared over sigma 2 squared. And this is in our interval, so loosely speaking, we're think thinking of 1 as a plausible value of our ratio of variances. And if this is a plausible value of our ratio of variances, then that means it's plausible that these variances are equal. But if we're interested in testing for equality of variances, we can do that more formally with a hypothesis test. And I do have another video for that. Now a little warning to finish, these methods can work very poorly when the normality assumption is violated. We did not investigate that normality assumption, and it's very conceivable that the normality assumption is not reasonable in this case. So when we are doing this type of investigation, we really should investigate that normality assumption using appropriate plots before going through and doing this analysis.